Well, as you can see, I've got a different t-shirt on <laughs> and Mary's got some different clothes on. So obviously it's a different day. <laughs> what happened was that our friend Jeff Whitehead came to do an interview and he arrived a bit earlier than planned. So we broke the Paget message discussion uh, at, as soon as he arrived and uh, we're continuing it the next morning. <laughs> so it's now the morning of the next day, Monday, and we're continuing the discussion of the Paget messages. And this particular message was the message that I've given to James Paget on December the 25th, 1915. And we were up to the second page or uh, up to the point where we started talking about the truth causing a division. So perhaps we just reread that paragraph that, sure. uh, that we, we were talking about just before we left mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we can join on from there. So let's do that. While the truth will cause a division, as I know, among men as to what the truth is and may even separate and cause bitter thoughts and even hatred to arise, in the souls of men towards their fellow men, and even brother may come to dislike brother. Yet the accomplishing of such results was not the object of my coming to earth and teaching the truths, but rather are the results of the unavoidable conflict between truth and error. Truth cannot compromise even for the sake of peace, and error will not submit or acknowledge its untruth so long as it can get any mortal to believe in and advocate, advocate it. And before we break, we just were discussing the, the principles of how truth can't compromise at all um, for, any, for, for any position. It won't fight for its position, but it won't compromise its position. And error always is trying to get other people to believe the same thing all the time. And we were talking about this relationship between truth and how it acts and error and how it acts. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting concept, I feel, and this idea that um, the error within us will, will try to get support for itself. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting dynamic, I think, if we begin to feel about that inside of ourselves. Yes. And you go on to say some really interesting things about that. As about well. error and how it acts. Yeah. 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 yeah, so let's start reading the rest of the message and we'll discuss it as it comes along. Yeah. And because of the great gift of free will to man, truth itself, with all the power and knowledge of the Father back of it, will not compel a man to accept it against his will. And hence, as man is very fallible and thinks and believes according to his finite mental faculties convince him that a certain thing is or is not true, he will not be willing to surrender his convictions until the truth shall come to him in such a way as to persuade him of its reality. And as men differ so much in the operations of their minds and reasoning faculties, there will necessarily be a great division among them as to what is and what is not true. And hence, there will arise disputes and hatred and even wars among them in maintaining their respective beliefs and opinions as to what is truth. So uh, this is a very important paragraph for people to understand, I feel. Yeah. The, the fact is that free, because, because truth honours free will and error does not honour free will, mm -hmm. truth has the effect of when we're in a state of truth, we don't force it upon other people, we just disclose it. We, we share it, but we don't force it upon others. And, and whether a person accepts that truth or not will depend largely on how ready the person is to accept the truth. Mm -hmm. And if they're not ready, if we can use ready in quotations to accept the truth, they, if they do not wish to accept that truth, they will fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it for as long as possible until something happens that causes them to go, oh, it was the truth after all. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that's what I was talking about here when I said that we, we're fallible and we we're not willing to surrender our convictions until the truth hits us like a truck, basically. <laughs> Usually it is the case. Yeah. And, and obviously the more humble we are, the truth only has to hit us like a brick instead of a truck. <laughs> and, and if we're more humble than that, it can hit us like a feather. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll notice and it. And we'll and notice it and it. Yep. be open to it and change. But for the majority of people, it does have to hit them like a truck, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's a huge amount of resistance and a huge amount of desire to hold on to false beliefs and a, 
and a big desire to never surrender them, never yeah. surrender these beliefs that yeah. you believe are true but actually are false. And unfortunately, because of this feeling that error has that it will never surrender um, and also a very angry feeling that it wants to uh, um, overcome another person's free will as well, uh, error will lead to people going to war, for example. Yeah. And so it leads to anger, rage, but even violence and other things as a result. Whereas truth doesn't lead to those things because when your person's really in truth, they don't fight. They don't have to push their truth down another person's throat and they don't have to push it into their lives. Mm. Mm. So let's talk about that, though, in terms of what you've said there, that truth has to hit people like a brick or a truck. <laughs> really, we're saying truth never actually forces itself upon a person. Never. But God's laws are actually designed to bring us truth all of the time. All of his laws are designed to yes. lead us to discover truth, aren't yes. they? And, and so perhaps we can give an example of what I mean that would be, by that. Yeah, I think so. So, so for example, um, in a relationship, yeah, say a partnership, a relationship between a man and a woman or, you know, a homosexual couple, that's fine. Whatever the relationship is, let's say in the relationship, one heart party in the relationship feels a degree of sadness about mm -hmm. what's going on in the relationship, just a small degree of sadness, and they feel that the other person, you know, doesn't really want them and doesn't really love them. But they ha have this belief, well, I love, I love the other person, so I'm going to stay in the relationship. And maybe and hopefully some point in the future that other person will work their way through their issues as to why they're not expressive of their love and I'll, and I'll eventually get some love in return. Mm -hmm. right? And then as they live in this place for years, the sadness of that state compounds, compounds and builds. Mm -hmm. Now, right at the beginning, they could have gone... Well, the other person quite obviously is not openly expressing their love, so we've got to do something about that, and that might mean withdrawing from the person for a while and just saying to them, look, I, I love you and care about you, but I, but I, I need a, a better connection than what we've got. And unless you're willing to deal with having a better connection, then we can't really have a relationship. They could have done that right at the beginning. But most people don't because of all these other reasons. And so, so what they do is they stay in the relationship and stay in the relationship longer and longer and longer. They'd never confront the person about the emotions. So they don't even, like, tell the person that, that you know, there's this feeling that they have. Now, as this goes on and on, their sadness generally increases. Mm -hmm. So now, now, instead of the feather, which is that gen gentle feeling that they had right at the beginning that maybe the other person doesn't love me, I feel like they don't really care about me, they don't act like they really want me. Instead of feeling all of that and then acting upon that feeling, what happens is the, in the feelings intensify and intensify and intensify to such an extent that arguments may develop and fights may develop and still we try to hold desperately on to the relationship and still try to desperately hold on to what's going on and one person's not compromising and the other person feels in their state of truth that they can't, they're starting to not be able to live with it, but they're not honouring that either. And then eventually it gets to the point of intensity where the person who's feeling unloved either, either is in so much grief and pain that, they, that, they, that the other person leaves them mm. <laughs> or they are in so much grief and pain that, that as soon as another person comes along outside of the relationship who shows them a little bit of attention, they are automatically uh, engaged with them sexually. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's the truck, like there's the obvious thing that something was wrong all of that time. Yeah. So, so what I'm, and the person themselves didn't want to accept the feather type of... Uh, the truth that the, was... The truth that was the already truth... coming to them. And in that, you're saying the truth is not forcing itself upon the person. It's, but it's, it's gently reminding them through the feelings that they're having and yeah. through the pain and suffering that they're experiencing. That, and initially, the pain and suffering was very small. And, and, but even just a little bit of pain and suffering, if we're sensitive to it, we'll go, right, something's out of harmony with love and truth here. So, and that's really what you're saying. The truth isn't hitting us like a brick, but our disharmony with truth always creates pain. And then that becomes the... Like a brick. Like a brick, <laughs> yeah. So eventually it starts off like a feather and eventually, yeah. depending on our willingness to avoid, yeah. um, it goes right, 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 right up to 
yeah. you know, so intense that it becomes that we, it's, can't ignore it like anymore. a truck hitting yeah. us, you know. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, most of the time, we could have engaged it much, much earlier. We could have engaged the, the truth much earlier, but, but because of our resistance to it, and like it says here, we're not willing to surrender our conviction. So, so, mm -hmm. so in the case that I, example I just gave, the man, if it was a man in this position, he, he would be not willing to surrender his convictions that she'll come around sooner or later, yeah. <laughs> or my partner will come around sooner or later. My partner will love me as much as I love her sooner or later, you know. Uh, they live on hope, and that's a part of their conviction. And, and they convinced and convinced that something will change. And while nothing's ever confronted in the, their partner, nothing will change emotionally. And, and the truth of that doesn't hit them either. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only once the, the issue gets bigger and the pain and suffering gets bigger that it finishes up that the truth, as it says here, the truth will, shall come to him in such a way as to persuade him of its reality. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. other words, now the truth has, is so strongly able to be seen and recognised that, that there's no other thing that he can do other than accept it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that's the operation of the, the truth in people's lives. And even, say, for spirits in the spirit world, they're sure. there for a long time and eventually the truth of, their, of what's happened to the, or their soul condition is, comes to them in a way that they can't deny anymore. Yeah, and in the example I've given, it was an individual example, but truth can also collectively come to mankind or large numbers of people at the same time. And an example I could give of that is, let's say, um, over thousands of years of human history, we've come to see that the whole concept, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, isn't a very good concept in that it, you know, if I, if I hit you and then you decide, well, because I've hit you, you've got to hit me. And then I decide, well, because you've hit me, I've now got to hurt you even more. And then you decide, well, now that you've hurt me more than I, you should hurt me more and so forth. And we have this escalating violence. Yeah. Right. If you, it, we can see the pattern of that in human history. Now, it should be big enough of pattern already for all of mankind currently on Earth to see that there's something wrong with it but it's not. Mm -hmm. The fact is we still have nations going to war. We still have people deciding to enter violent reactions like that where, where it's like, quid, what is it called, quid pro quo? Like, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you back what you gave me. Yeah. And, and, and yet nobody seems to, seems to be persuaded yet that that particular concept of error is, is obviously flawed, yeah. you know, that it's yeah. obviously false. And, and so there are some things globally that, that the error has to be so intense. And even like if we look at our history in the last hundred years, we've had two world wars where the majority of people in the world were involved in war with huge amounts of losses of life. I think there was something like 55 million people in the Second World War died from, from, from the conflict mm -hmm. who were involved in the conflict. And, and yet it's still not enough for us to say, well, let's throw away all of our guns and throw away all of our munitions and, you know, yep. stop producing arms and oh, it's still not enough. Yeah. So you wonder sometimes how, what the event is going to have to be yeah. that will persuade man of the reality yeah. that, that their current belief is in error and they need to accept a different truth. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. But that's an example of, a, a, you know, where we can collectively accept truth if we decided yeah. to. Yeah. But the, and the key point from that paragraph is really, though, that truth will never compel a man to accept it against his will. No. So it's only when the pain of living in disharmony with truth becomes so much that we decide to change our will yes. that we will receive truth. Yes. And yeah. for a person who's wanting to practice divine truth, the key thing for them is to, uh, is to ask themselves, am I sensitive to disharmony? Because the more sensitive you become to disharmony, the less intense the event will need to be to convince you of the truth. 
Exactly. And that's yeah. where humility is involved. If you're, if you're not humble at all, then you're going to need these huge events to convince you of the truth. But if you're very, very humble, you'll only need tiny little events, little tiny things that happen in the course of a day to convince you of the truth. And it's almost, I, I often think, the more we open and the more sensitive we allow ourselves to become or the more humble we become, things that used to we would have said our feathers mm. start to feel, feel like, like bricks. <laughs> because <laughs> so we become more sensitive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're not really avoiding the intensity, you're actually heightening the intensity. Yeah, and that is fantastic because yes. what it means is that it doesn't need a big event to trigger you into accepting a truth. And of course, from the point of view of growing towards God, the faster and or with more rapidity that we can accept the truth, the better it will be. Yeah. The, the, more, the more rapid we, we can see it, and that's due to our sensitivity to it, mm-hmm. and, and acknowledge it and live in it, and that's due to our desire to live in harmony with the laws that we, we, we've now discovered. Once we become more sensitive to that process, then obviously we'll very rapidly absorb new truth as a result. But, but for the majority of people on the planet and people who are practicing divine truth, the, it's got to be a very big event before they go, oh, I get it now, you know, yeah. or oh, I realise I've got to change, or yeah. oh, I realise that I'm not being very loving there and I've got to change that particular action. And, uh, and that's the sad thing I feel. The problem with this stoicism that exists on the planet is it, it, causes, it, and it causes a hardness in the soul, a lack of sensitivity, and so people are completely clueless to, to these little tiny events that are happening in their life. And so it has to be big events that happen before they actually change. And if you talk to a lot of people who have terminal illnesses, for example, they finish up changing a lot of their life when they get the terminal illness, mm-hmm. not before they get the terminal illness. And they don't have any idea as to why the terminal illness has been created by their own body inside of themselves, not realising there's emotional links to it. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so it's only the fact now that they're dying that causes them to change. Yeah. And, that's a, and I find that's a sad thing about humanity. It's only, sometimes it's only large-scale death or the personal, facing your personal death, that causes you to actually change. Yeah. And what we need to do is reduce that down to a very sensitive event that we are. Oh, we notice, you know, a bird doing this in our company and, yeah. and we change, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, because yeah. we see the, ex- the external event as something that our soul is reflecting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, okay, next, we're on the next page here. So while these feelings of discord must necessarily follow the advent of truth, yet I did not come for the purpose of bringing a sword, but for the purpose of showing men what the truths are and of causing harmony and belief in these truths. Never is hatred nor discord nor war among men justified, no matter what the cause. And if men will only learn the truth, there will never exist such feelings or acts. So that's pretty plain what that paragraph says. Yeah, saying, it? it's, it's going back to a few paragraphs ago, the reference to the idea that you, you came to create division on the planet. Mm. And um, I like there where you say, yes, discord will happen after truth is spoken because there's error and truth existing. Mm. But your vision is to bring harmony within truth. Yes. Yeah. And if error didn't fight for its position, there would be no disharmony. Yeah. Because truth is not going to fight for its position. Yeah. It's only error that fights for its position. Mm-hmm. So if, uh, if people gave up the concept of fighting for what they believe in, then, then truth and error could actually exist together even in yeah. relative harmony. Yeah. But unfortunately, error itself usually wishes to fight for its position. Well, that's yeah. what I was going to say. Can we say that we're in truth if we want to fight for our beliefs? No, we can't. No. Uh, if we want to fight for our beliefs, we're not in truth whatsoever. Yeah. And we're certainly not in love. Yeah. 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 Okay, so say then the truth is of itself a thing apart and admits of no variations or modifications. And here I'm now speaking about the divine truth or absolute truth. And hence, the minds of men must submit to and embrace truth. It will never accommodate itself to the beliefs of men. One is fixed and unchangeable. So the truth, divine truth is fixed and unchangeable. And the other is always changeable. And until founded on a knowledge of the truth, will at some time or other have to change. 
because in the end, truth will be established in the hearts of minds and minds of men, so that harmony and peace shall reign in all of God's universe. So if we think about it, is God's there in a position of absolute truth. We're here in this position of what, what we probably wisely call relative truth. In other words, we know some, some things about the absolute truth, and then we think some other things are true that are obviously not, yeah. that God obviously doesn't think are true. Mm -hmm. Then as we grow in truth, we're becoming more and more, we're absorbing more and more of the divine truth. God is not going to ever modify God's truth to suit us. And I still find that the majority of people we speak to and who come along to our seminars believe that will happen. Yeah. They sort of somehow believe that God's going to manipulate God's laws and change God's ways just for you, just for the person, you know, just yeah. for their situation. <laughs> and, and this is where I find uh, also the reason why a lot of people ask questions and say, they say to us, you haven't really discussed the answer to this question. I'm sorry. No, uh, if anybody listens to the 800 hours or so of presentations already on YouTube, they'll, they'll realise, if they understand the principles, that I've almost answered every question that you could ever ask. Yeah, right? because there's a set of guiding principles and laws <laughs> exactly. that define the answer to every question. So when a yeah. person comes and asks a specific question, saying to me, oh, but you haven't answered this question before, this is a great demonstration of how little they understand the law. The, the laws of truth, the God's laws, if you like, which are all based around truth. And so uh, my feelings are here that people need to come to understand these laws and also don't expect God to modify them for their own condition or for their own from their own perspective. If something's not happening in the relationship between them and God, if, God's, if they cannot feel God's love entering their heart, it's because they are out of harmony with truth. It's yeah. not because God is. Yeah. And so many people want to say, oh, you know, yeah, I long every day. And then I say to them, well, do you, do you receive love every day? No. And I go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because if you're longing every day and you've truly got a pure, sincere longing every day, you would be receiving love because that's one of the laws. Yeah. So, so if, if you say you've got a longing and you're not receiving love while you've got the longing you say you have, mm -hmm then that means you don't have a longing that's sincere because yeah. that's the law <laughs> and they don't want to come to face to face with that truth. Yeah. yeah, I mean, God's got a fairly efficient system to give us feedback, mm -hmm. especially once we're given the knowledge of the laws. Exactly. We, we can measure our growth, our tr level of truth, all of these things just by understanding the operations of the laws. Yeah. And yet, I, I agree, many of us, including myself at times. <laughs> try to bend it. Try to, or just live in denial mm -hmm, of what mm -hmm. the feedback I'm already receiving. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's really saying, I, I don't really want to know the truth or I think God's but, going to come around. <laughs> yeah, but it's almost also saying, oh, you know, God's at fault for not giving me love. Yeah, like, I and, never feel that. But yeah, yeah, but, you know, that's what it's really saying a lot of the times when people say, oh, I've been longing for love, and then you ask them, have you been getting it? And they say, no. But have you ever considered that that means you mustn't be longing for it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's, the subsequent, that's the only possible uh, subsequent result from them not receiving it. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, and, but most people don't want to admit to themselves that, that their longing is not sincere and their desire is not pure, and so they stay steadfast mm. in their error, yeah. wanting to believe that their error is true, and they may stay like that for years. I, I know people who've been longing for divine love for years and have never received it, and never question why. Mm. Never question why. And it must be something within themselves, otherwise they'd be receiving it. Yeah. 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 And when people say, well, what does it feel like to receive God's love? Well, you wouldn't even ask that feeling if you'd received God's love. <laughs> you yeah. wouldn't even ask the question if you received God's love because you'd already know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Because it's a very intensely personal feeling with God. You yeah, feel intensely personal and emotional. God. Yeah. yeah. And so you can't, you can't avoid the experience once, no. it's ex once it's experienced. So if you're asking the question, you haven't experienced it. Yeah. yeah. But I know, I mean, on that subject, I, I feel that because people also want to live in denial, Often they attract um, they attract situations with spirits where spirits give with them spirit feelings, and spirits give them and nice warm fuzzies. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's divine love, <laughs> yeah. or or they start to do intellectual gymnastics around what's happening and why yeah. it's happening, rather than just saying, okay, 
Something, I don't feel something's wrong closer here. to God in this scenario. So mm. there's a truth I'm avoiding. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So then I said, error does not exist in the world because God created it or permits it to exist, but solely because there belongs to man un- an unrestricted will, which controls and influences his thoughts and acts, and which in turn is influenced by the desires and appetites of the mortal. So this is a very key point too. Definitely. Like most, we find that a lot of people still blame God for their life. They, still, they blame God for all sorts of things. And they also expect God to come and rescue them from their life mm-hmm. without acknowledging that God cannot be blamed for any of the pain in their life. And God also cannot rescue them from any of the pain in their life because they or others who are, who, who are mortal have created this pain and suffering in their life. And until they are willing to acknowledge how they've created this pain and suffering in their life, no rescue can be accomplished. Yeah. And yeah. it's very important for people to understand that. Yep. I noticed said that if God did not permit evil and carnal thoughts and desires to exist in the world, there would be no reason or possibility for man to exercise his will in a way that would bring him to all these feelings of hatred, etc., that I speak of. But this is merely saying that if a man had not the power of free will, he would commit no sin and indulge in no error. For you must know that in his creation, he was given not only the privilege and the power under certain conditions to become a being entirely free from sin, which is merely the violation of God's established laws, but also the privilege and power to violate these laws. As he wills, so he shall be. So here we were speaking, or I was speaking to to Paget about the importance of understanding the power of his will. If he exercised his will in a certain direction, he could transform his entire soul into perfection through the reception of divine love. But if he exercised his will in another direction, then he would exercise his will in the direction of evil and then create the results of such evil in his life. Now... All God did was give us the gift of free will. Mm. How we use that will is completely up to us. And this is what I go on to explain. Yep. That, and in fact, the next paragraph is probably an important part to, to, to explain with it. So I said, it said, everything in nature may be turned into an instrument of harm if the laws which establish the functionings and workings of these things are violated. Sin is an abstract thing, as an abstract thing, does not exist, but is the result of disobedience to some law whose operations in conformity to its creation must be pursued and should always be pursued. And men who violate it must suffer the consequences of such violation. Mm -hmm. So here's I was explaining that everything that's being created has a functional purpose for its creation. And what mankind often does is misuse the particular thing yep. for some evil endeavour. And it's yep. a bit like uh, our use of a knife, if you could liken it like that. It's, it has many fantastic purposes, yes. like, particularly if you're preparing food, right? Yep. Um, but it also has other purposes as well. But, but, it, but it also can stab a person to death. Yeah. But, but it depends on the will of the person who's using the implement. Yep. And the same if we see our will as an implement. Yes. Then it, then it would depend on, of course, how we use our will as to what kind of effect it's going to have. Mm-hmm. If we use it in a negative direction, in an unloving direction, it will create evil and it will create pain and suffering. If we use it in a loving and truthful direction, and a, it will create beautiful, loving things all the time and create joy and happiness. Yeah. And we need to understand the relationship between pain and suffering and the use improper our- use of our will. Yeah, 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 definitely. And this point that um, he touches on, uh, that you touch on <laughs> uh, earlier about, um, well, it's really an idea in the world that God, but God created evil because he got, he created the potential for evil, which is not really a logical um, no, argument at all. Not at all. And it's also not, uh, how can one learn how to love um, for themselves, learn about what love does and how to use our will lovingly. If we're if we're restricted from explore, you know, using our will in another direction, it becomes a very limited. If we only have loving options, then 
we don't really understand the gift that love is or what love really does or it, I'm not explaining it very well. Yeah, but true. Do you, do you uh, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do yeah. see what you're saying. I, I sort of feel like... Um, I feel it's more about mankind's feeling of rebellion than, than anything else. Um, we, mankind has this concept which began with the first human couple that, that they can be gods in their own right. In other words, they can determine how the universe operates. Mm -hmm. Now, that's obviously not worked very well because we have proof that mankind cannot change any single law that governs the operation of the universe all mankind can do is attempt to break it or, or live by it. And what I'm recommending here is that man chooses to live by each law. Sure. But to do that, you've got to discover the law and have a desire to discover it. And that is an exercise of your will, again, yeah. Yeah. and how you exercise your will. I, I do feel, though, that we don't need unloving events in order to know and understand love. So no, that, and that wasn't what I was trying to say. I know, um, yeah. and that's but, but that's what some people probably hearing yes, might have yeah, interpreted. Yeah, so, yeah. so if you can explain further what you meant in terms of the exercise of your will, it's very hard for me to describe <laughs> because it's a feeling rather than um, it's just a knowledge that I have that uh, it's about the per, the function of free will that. Um, it's like the laws exist mm -hmm. and they exist whether we uh, acknowledge them or not. And God exists whether we acknowledge her or not. Mm -hmm. They're in existence. But as her children, she's given us this gift of self-awareness, of mm -hmm. understanding what it is to be a, 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 an entity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the responsibility that entails. Yes, but also the potentials, the incredible, creative, positive potentials of understanding ourselves and understanding and using our will. And the power of what we create. The, yes. Mm -hmm. the, and just that our very nature is creative. Mm -hmm. Every one of God's children's... And every time we resist the law or resist exercising our will in harmony with the law, we're creating negative things. We're creating things that are like that are going to result in pain and suffering. Yep. But even that is... Is a um, reflection of our creation. Yes, yeah. and, and that's what she wants us to learn about mm -hmm. and also to learn that these laws exist whether we acknowledge them or not, but using our will to come into harmony and relationship with those laws mm -hmm. is another thing entirely. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that for each of us, even now, people listening, we know something of God's laws, but that's an entirely different process than bringing our will into harmony with and living in those laws. And yes. that's really what I feel God has. This is this amazing, immense potential and opportunity God is giving all of us. Mm. And we don't really understand the power of it until we use our will in that way. Well, I feel most, it's even worse than that. Most people on the planet are using their will in, in rejection or rebellion of any law. Yeah. And, and as a result of that, and then they look at all the suffering and then they want to blame God for it. <laughs> that yes. comes as a result of using yeah. their will in, in rebellion. Yeah. And, and even amongst uh, people who have heard divine truth, we frequently hear them saying, yeah, I don't want to accept that particular thing yet, <laughs> which is an indication of the rebellion yeah. that, that they are still in. Yeah. And then for some reason, they expect themselves to be happy <laughs> or they expect there to be no pain created in their life. Or, or even just that they're a little bit shocked at how much pain there is. Yeah, yeah. and, and what, we, what we need to come to understand personally is there is a direct relationship between the personal pain we experience in our own life and the breaking of the law. Yeah. yeah. If we lived in harmony with every law, there would be no personal pain yeah. and there would only be joy and happiness. So, it, so one of the things I've had to come to terms with myself right back in the early days of my memories of all of these things was I had to come to terms with the fact that, yeah, I'm in quite a lot of pain, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there was a time right before then that I came to recognise, before I came to recognise this, that I really just would have liked to die, you know. And I realised, yeah, that's a lot of personal pain I'm in. And then I had to come to terms with the fact that I, not somebody else, mm. had created this state through my choices that were out of harmony with law. Yeah. Now, that's a pretty big thing to come to terms with, but... 
it is something that is essential to come to terms with if we wish to progress. Mm -hmm. The majority of people still wish to blame somebody else for their personal pain. Now, I can release my pain. Now, while somebody else has created the pain, perhaps during the environment or during my childhood growing years, there's pain being created there, I have the choice to release it. And I still, even in pain, have the choice to, to, positive, to positively embrace living in harmony with all of God's law yeah. and finding out what they are rather than just trying to ignore it all. Yeah. And what I came to terms with then was I realised, ah, my personal pain, any time I feel personal pain, it means that I am personally out of harmony with one of God's laws. Mm -hmm. I personally, mm -hmm. not anybody else. And that caused me to be far more self-reflective and humble than, than the majority of people I meet are. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of people still want to blame other people for the pain that they experience. And, and just, just because we've lived in an environment that's created pain, it doesn't mean then that we, we have the right or, or even the, the, uh, that we, have the, uh, we should have the desire to blame those people for this pain. The pain is in us and only we can address it. Absolutely. And, and what I came, had to come to terms with, with uh, was that I, and in the usage of my will as a result of what happened from my past, I, in the usage of my will, was taking actions that were creating my own pain. Yeah. And once I understood that more fully, I could then find out, well, what is God's law on this matter? And I could then process emotionally through whatever I needed to release so that I could live in harmony with God's law. And then all of a sudden, all of those painful things that I felt pain about all disappeared. Yeah. And I took different actions, which resulted in more positive results yeah. rather than feeling this pain constantly. And this, uh, like I see a lot of people, you know, they even in rebellion about just accepting the fact that oh, the pain from my past is, oh, the reason it's still in me is as a result of ignoring God's laws. Is and it a the, result of then, me choosing to not release it? Yes. <laughs> uh, then people say, but I didn't know about the laws and what about, you know, and I took these actions. And, and, and again, <laughs> this is again just a resistance to the truth yeah. of accepting the law. Now that you and know, what are you going to do? <laughs> are you going to sit there and fight that you didn't know? Exactly. Or, or are you going to embrace the law that you now know? <laughs> it, it, which only creates more pain. And, yeah. you know, you're talking about then recognising, wow, if I just act in harmony with law, then the pain ends. And I suppose what I was trying to say before is that there's so many gifts. It's not just the end to pain. No. <laughs> there is so much potential within us yeah. that if we just understand the laws of God, they get unlocked. No, it's not only just understanding them, though, is it? Uh, is living, it, is I'm it, sorry. We want to have a desire submitting. to... Let's use the word submitting because well, that's very... Well, even more positive than that, I would use the word pos developing a positive desire to exercise our will in harmony with the law. To actively... To honour the law. Yes. Because we love it. Yes. And because we recognise that love exists in it. Yes. And um, what I see a lot of people doing, they see the law and then they go, oh, that's a bummer of a law. You know, yeah. that's a I don't like law. that law. Oh, yeah. like, I don't like that law. I'm not going to live in harmony with that law. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as a result, they still get pain and then they want to blame somebody for the pain. Oh, you know, learning about divine truth was useless because I'm still in a lot of pain. Well, of course you are because you still break most of the yeah. laws that you've yeah. heard. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the more you learn, and the more, the more of them you realise you break, which is going to have its own consequence, <laughs> and particularly when you choose to not follow them. Yeah. And one of the discussions we've had recently was about, in our private life, was about honouring the law, no matter what you feel, yeah. continuing to honour the law and to honour the fact and have faith in the fact that every single one of God's laws are truth and every single one of God's laws all are loving. Yeah. And if we truly honoured that, we wouldn't be ever saying to ourselves, oh, I know that I'm doing the wrong thing there, but I'm still going to go ahead and do it. We'd never say that. No. Because we'd know that, that every time I choose to say that, I'm choosing pain. I'm yeah. choosing suffering. I'm, uh, and it's like I said yesterday in the interview with Jeff, it's like stupidity to the maximum if you think about it. Yeah. You, there's God with all these beautiful laws that are all loving and all truthful and, all, and they're all supporting our growth. And we're then saying, no, I want to stay in rebellion to one of them because I don't think it is loving and I don't think it is truthful. Yeah. And uh, like, who's arrogant there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that is really just a position of stupidity. We're just having a big argument with God 
Yeah. And of course, we're, we're not going to end up on, the, on, a very, on, on a very positive end of the argument if we're having yeah. an argument with God. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, who's more powerful? I don't know. And whose laws are more powerful and yeah. you know, who created us? But. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when we discussed this message together in the past, just with our private reading of it, um, we talked a lot about this idea and we know people who, who put their fear above the law a, a lot. And always. Almost always. Yeah. yeah. And people who've learnt about the truth about abortion and then... And then gone ahead and gone had Gone ahead one. and had one. Mm. Or people who have... Who, who love divine truth and then they get in a situation with their family or their, their friends and then and they... And they compromise it all. Yeah. Mm. Want, to, want to bend the truth. And, mm. and you said some really powerful things to me about how fear fear makes us want to bend the rules so much mm -hmm. and yet it can't lead to anything but further pain mm. because the law is the law. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and even though our emotions feel so uh, intense or overwhelming or uh, the point is we're not letting them overwhelm us. No, we're, ju we're wanting to... We're know, not humble to them. Yeah, then then we just like lose sight of law. We we, we actively want to dismiss law. Yes, and we have this concept in us that our fear is more important to us than honouring the law. Yeah, and and in a way, what we're really saying is that our fear is more important to us than God, mm. and our fear is even more important to us than our own happiness. Yeah, like it, it's a when you think about it from a logical perspective, it's the most illogical thing you could ever choose to do. Yeah, and it, yeah, but but. Often when we're in fear, we, we don't have a very good sense of logic either <laughs> because our fear as an emotion drives the action. Yeah. yeah. And that's the error, isn't it? It's mm. the error fighting for dominance and exactly. the error wanting and, to. And fear, like we've, we've noticed frequently and we've had a lot of things recently come to us, you know, that, that are all showing how the world wants to retain the fear and, and wants to justify the reason for the fear. And, and that is the error fighting for its dominance still. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen many examples, one, one of which we mentioned in the interview with Jeff yesterday that we saw with, with a lady who was raped and wanted to have a gun with yeah. her. She wanted the gun laws changed so she could carry a gun in future. Yeah. And, and, you know, her fear driving this, this really unloving behaviour and potential for a lot of badness as a result of it uh, and, her, and her experience of the rape driving this rage which mm -hmm. drives her desire to now want to be able to kill somebody who rapes her and 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 while we understand the emotions that are present you know both of us have had sexual assaults in our yeah. life in the past and and so and in in the first century in particular mm -hmm. and so we understand what it means to be sexually assaulted but but we still don't feel it justifies getting a gun and shooting the person no. um, and in fact, that brings, again, its own consequences to the soul. And, and uh, this is what happens on the planet, is we're constantly, it seems, mankind is constantly justifying the position of fear to themselves. Yeah. Instead of going, well, well, yes, I have fear, mm -hmm. and yes, I am afraid of that, but I've got to stop justifying this position of fear and honour the position of truth and act in harmony with the position of truth. And eventually all of these things that I'm afraid of will all disappear as a result mm -hmm. of me doing that. It's really the thing that liberates us from fear. Mm. Um, mm. But uh, when we have, when we hold on to pain from the past, when we hold on to and justify fear, we, it makes us want to have, and it also we want to draw people into that experience yes. to validate the fact we that we want them to share in our painful. fear. Yeah, yeah. And, we want um, them to tell us that yes, what happened to us was bad, and yeah. and yes, we shouldn't have to ever release it. <laughs> and this is one of the feelings that I've often had about the relationship between truth and error on the earth plane, yeah. because it is such a mixed bag. <laughs> um, um, I, I've often felt like. Error is more powerful because of this very thing, because it bullies people and draws on their fear and pull, tries to pull them in. And it feels like the numbers grow of people in error or fear or anger. And the people in truth are never going to try and bend your will. And they're never going to try and force that truth onto anyone. So it feels like standing alone sometimes. Yeah, and I can't agree with that. I know that feels like that for you frequently. But like I feel 
Every person who stands in truth stands with God. And God is the most powerful being in the universe. So That's why I wanted to bring this up, because yeah. I know that a lot of people feel like this. Yeah. But when you really experience standing in truth, then you go, whoa, this is powerful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the error within us and within me as I'm expressing yeah. often makes me cling to fear and go... And cling to the concept even that error is more powerful. Yes, mm. cling to that and I can't go to the position of truth. Like yesterday we did this interview with Jeff and, you know, I just feel completely exposed because we were so open and honest about everything <laughs> yeah, yeah. in our lives. And then you go into a meltdown about being in truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was really good for me because yeah. I I did stand in truth and but it brought up all my fears about yes. that. And that's the beauty that of honouring the law. Yeah. Honouring the laws of truth cause all the emotions just to flow out naturally. Yeah. And this is something I feel many people don't understand. They don't have to try to access their emotions. So when I look at people trying to access their emotions all the time, I'm feeling like, yeah, it would be better if you lived in harmony with the law and lived in harmony with truth and love. And you'll find all the emotions will Trust just come popping out <laughs> yeah. all the time, you know, because and you get confronted every single and day. And all of your resistances to, to that emotion comes out. You know, exactly. every, every part of the process you have to step through anyway. Yeah. It's like when we try to get to our emotions, we're trying to circumvent all the blocks and the resistance and the fears we have about that grief. Whereas I'm finding the more I just live in harmony with the laws, well, there's my fear, there's my resistance. Oh, now I'm in the actual feeling. But I got there in a way that helped me deal with a lot of uh, global blocks that yeah. stop me being emotional all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So, so this, uh, this important state is that, uh, to understand is that, you know, up to this point, is that everything in nature could be used badly mm -hmm. by the soul who desires to use it badly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we often get questions about, oh, well, why did God create drugs then, like poppies or, you know, and, yeah. and you know, that, doesn't that indicate that we should use drugs? And I go, well, no, it doesn't <laughs> indicate we should use drugs. Every single thing God's created has a purpose, and sometimes the purpose is to replenish the ground with a certain mineral. Sometimes the purpose, you know, it's all sorts of purposes. The insects all have a purpose, but it doesn't mean that we use them badly. Yeah. If we use them out of harmony with the law in which they credit, it is always going to come back and, and harm us in some yeah. way. And this is why people who do take drugs eventually are harmed in many ways. Yeah. Their spirit body is harmed. They're often overcloaked by spirits who are in dark places, which causes them a lot of harm. Many of them lose a sense of themselves and they become psychotic mm -hmm. uh, as a result. And, uh, and even that, if you look at their day-to-day -day life, they're often willing to steal or to, you know, to do dangerous things in their life as a result of their, of their taking drugs, all driven by deeper emotions, mm -hmm. all driven by some kind of event in their past that they're trying to shut down and stay away from. But, but in the end, the excuse of saying, oh, but God made these natural things, natural substances, so I should be able to use them, is not a very good uh, argument for, for doing anything. Yeah. You know, it's like God made a cliff too. Does that mean you should jump <laughs> off it? <laughs> and no, of course not, you know, like, unless you've got some other way of catching yourself at the bottom. Um, of course it doesn't mean you should jump off it. You're not going to be safe. And, and this is something that we need to understand is that, is that just because God made something, God, God made everything for a purpose. Everything had a role in, in, its, in its truth. Mm -hmm. It has a role of some kind. But more mankind, yeah. and often more than one, yeah. and mankind frequently uses it out of harmony with the, with the truth of its original role. And that, of course, results in damage to the soul and, and to the physical yeah. body and spirit bodies of the people involved. Yeah. And you can't expect any different to that. So, yeah. so the argument that God created something so we should be able to use it is not... Uh, a certain way is not a very good argument. And I feel there's an extreme amount of arrogance in that, in that we're not yet living in harmony with love and truth. So how can we even know the full potentials <laughs> of that thing exactly. and what, it, what God created it for? Because we're viewing it through our error-based exactly. belief systems right now and going, oh, that's its purpose. Yeah. When often we've seen like you know, hundreds of years after someone discovers a plant, they discover, wow, it's got it's this got... medicinal, <laughs> exactly, you know, yeah, property yeah. in it and all yeah. of these things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. So um, let's proceed still because it's still a very good discussion about truth and, and law. Mm. It's, 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 I say mortals may not fully realise that every law 
carries with it a penalty for its violation. And this applies to the smallest law in the material universe, as well as to the greatest law in the spiritual kingdom. And this penalty is just as sure in its operation as is the law itself. So every single law has uh, actually, and it's something that many people probably don't consider, every single law has a negative consequence for its violation, but it also has a positive consequence for, its, for, for being in harmony with it. So, so, see, most people just focus on the negative consequence of the violation without thinking that every single law God has crea ever created has always a positive loving consequence if you live in harmony with it. And I feel this is one of the problems that we, we face on the planet is we, we see everything very negatively because that's usually the perspective from which we're coming. But we don't understand that God would never have created these laws mm -hmm. unless there was some positive consequence for the law. So the fact is... There is a positive consequence for every law when we act in harmony with it compared to a negative consequence for the law if we, that's painful if we act out of harmony with it. Yep. And this is the same for every law. Mm -hmm. not, not, you know, if, we, if we look at the law of gravity, for example, right the way, which is a physical law, right the way to the biggest soul-based laws about receiving divine love. Mm -hmm. Every one of these laws has a positive part as well as the, the negative part. And in fact, from God's perspective, the main reason why God created it was for the positive part and the negative part was created as a feedback system so that we could be corrected yep. into becoming more loving. And so, isn't it funny <laughs> that we view law in general in this very, as you say, in this very negative light, we see it as like restrictive and punishing and yet compliance with law is so liberating, isn't yeah. it? It's so expansive. Now that might not be the case for mankind's law because yeah. mankind <laughs> hasn't, hasn't given as much um, you say as much uh, con concept to the positive outcome of living in law <laughs> yeah. as they have to the negative consequence of not following it. Um, whereas God does do that. God, mm. God has given this beautiful outcome with, every, with the following of every law. Yeah. And we need to come to recognise that. And God has also given this beautiful result that is the negative consequence for not following the law so that we have some kind of feedback mechanism. And the consequences on both sides are just as sure as the law themselves are sure. Yeah. And this is what we need to also understand. If we live in harmony with the truth of the law, then the positive consequence will surely come to us. Like yeah. It's guaranteed. Just as if we live out of harmony with the law, the negative consequence is surely going to come to us. And that's really <laughs> such a hopeful message, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. 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 And this is something that I was trying to get across uh, to Paget as, as, as I was talking about these things. Mm. I said, a man may be created physically almost perfect, and so long as he lives in that way, which does not violate some physical law, which is operating to keep him in that physical perfection, he will suffer no pain or disharmony in his being. But just as soon as he does violate this law, the penalty therefore asserts itself and he suffers. Now this arises not because there was existing in the abstract any pain and suffering, that had not, not man violated this law, he would never have known that there was such a thing as pain and suffering. But when he did violate the law, there came into operation the penalty, which, as I said, is always the result of violating the laws of harmony. So here I'm trying to illustrate the, the linkage between the consequence and pain and suffering. And, and this is something I feel most people on the planet don't understand very well either. Mm -hmm. If we are in pain and suffering, it's not because of any other reason than some law has been violated. And usually we have violated it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as adults, isn't it? Especially as adults. Yeah. Um, and even as children, though, we violate many, many laws. But, but the consequence of the violation of laws as a child rests oftentimes with our parents. So they are the person that experiences generally more pain as a result. Mm -hmm. But as we grow up and we start acting upon these different uh, damages that have happened in our childhood, we, and we start acting in out of harmony with the laws, then of course the negative consequence is now also applied upon our own soul and also our surroundings. Now, if we have this viewpoint co constantly that, oh, something bad happened to me, it must be your fault, <laughs> <laughs> then we're taking away our power to change anything. And we're also not understanding this basic principle about God and the way God's created law. When we act in harmony with a law, 
we, it will always result in a good thing happening for us. Right? Always. It is a guarantee. Such an important point, isn't it? Yes. And if we act out of harmony with the law, we are guaranteed pain and suffering. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. You can't avoid it. Yeah. And once we understand this relationship between pain and suffering and joy and happiness, the fact is that joy and happiness is the result of following the law, and pain and suffering is the result of not following the law, we will become more self-reflective about what law it is that has created our the pain, pain and suffering. suffering. Yeah. And, you know, I've had uh, many times where I've had to stop focusing on the other person and I go, OK, I'm feeling some pain from this particular thing. Now, that is immaterial. That means that I, you know, God doesn't, God, the consequences of law aren't such that I feel the pain created by other people's <laughs> experiences, yeah. I'm feeling a pain because something is out of harmony inside of me mm -hmm. that creates this pain mm -hmm. that I experience. And I've had to come to terms with it. Often, often it's a lack of love of myself that mm. created this pain and suffering. And I've lived in situations where I've often thought, oh, I'm getting this pain and suffering living here, pain and suffering living here. I stay living it, I stay living it, I stay living it. Until I get to the point in time where I go, hang on a sec. I'm breaking the law, <laughs> not them. Yeah, yeah. No, that, they're breaking another law, but that's immaterial. I'm breaking a law because I'm the one experiencing this pain and suffering. Yeah. If, if I was in complete harmony with all the laws, no matter what the other person did, I still would not feel pain and suffering. Yeah. And this is something that most people don't understand either. My pain and suffering is not the result of the other person breaking the law. Yeah. No matter what they do, even if they murder me, my pain and suffering if I had any, is not the result of them breaking the law. It is a result of my breaking a law. Now, most people go, well, how is that the case? Well, if I am not breaking any law, and if I'm perfectly in harmony with all of God's laws, when they murder me, I won't feel pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. I won't feel pain about leaving loved ones on earth. I won't feel suffering of any physical suffering that would have occurred during a murder. And in my death in the first century, that's how it was for me. And people, people, you know, try to blow my death out of all proportion, cause, you know, saying that it's the suffering that he did for mankind. And I didn't suffer during my death. Yeah. I didn't suffer, yeah. right? And this is something they don't understand. I didn't suffer because I was in harmony with the law, mm. right? So let's talk about then. Um, I see people saying, okay, uh, God's universe operates on truth. That means that I should tell the truth. I should really go and tell the truth to, you know, my wife that I cheated on her. I mm -hmm. should, yeah. and, and then they say, this isn't causing less pain. This is causing more pain. So... Um, you see, this is that, where they're not being honest with themselves. Yes. It's really exposing the pain of past ignorance of the law, isn't it? And not only that, not only that, the fact is... Whenever we have withheld the truth from another that we needed to have told them, and particularly in relationships, you see that occurring, yeah. there is an automatic blockage between the two parties in the relationship. So pain is already being experienced mm. in the relationship. And often the person who's on the receiving end of that will not understand why it's being caused until you tell them, well, I'm cheating on you. Then Now they know why. Yeah. They, they have felt a large degree of pain. Yeah. They know the, the, now what the cause was. Yeah. And... Also, just because we ignore an error, it doesn't mean that the pain and suffering hasn't already been created. Mm -hmm. It means that both or one or both parties are stoically trying to shove down their pain. And that's the reason why they're trying to ignore the error. Now, when we tell the truth, the error will be exposed. And of course, once an error is exposed, the pain and suffering is also exposed yep. that, that the error created. And, and the real truth is, if I didn't engage the error, then the pain and suffering wouldn't have existed. So, for example, in a relationship, if I didn't treat, uh, cheat on my wife, then she wouldn't feel any pain and suffering about me cheating on her. Mm -hmm. That's reality. So, so when we try to explain it as in a different way, we are really just trying to fool ourselves and fool our partner. Yeah. And, that, and that's not a loving act. I suppose, I, and I was just... Um, can't, Trying to ask you about the point of the fact that when we've lived in error for a long time and we start to bring ourselves in harmony with, with God's laws, hmm. there is pain. Yeah, but it's not there? because of the truth. 
No. no. And that's, it's that's... because we've now come to face to face with the error. Yes. And of course we're going to exceed the pain of the error that we've been in. Yeah. And, and this, is a part, this is a great part of, of, of bringing ourselves to God because what God's saying to us is, see, you were ignoring that pain before, but now you're realising that it did create pain. Yeah. That error did create pain. And it's sort of like, like we notice this with all sorts of issues with people when we meet them and we talk to them about the pain they're actually in, that they deny. Mm. And, and they say, oh, no, I'm not in pain. But didn't you, didn't you have five abortions? And they, they sort of look at you and, yes, you know, I had five abortions. Well, have you never felt the pain of those abortions, like of what that's happened to each one of those child, children, what happened to you having to choose to do that? And, and you can see that they haven't even let themselves feel about it. But as soon as they begin to let themselves feel about it, the yes. painful emotions yeah. start arising. Yeah. And, th and this is a good thing because what it means is they're becoming more sensitive to their pain. Yeah. And if they become more sensitive to their pain, they also might become more sensitive to in future operating in harmony with the law. Yes, and that, that is the thing, isn't it? We, we have to move through this where we've accepted the error as more important than the law and, mm. and the consequences of then what that's created as we come into harmony with the law, that is exposed so that we can live, live in harmony with the law yeah. without any effort from then on. Yes. So uh, the error as it comes out of us will undoubtedly be painful yeah. <laughs> because error is always painful as it comes out of us. Yeah. Truth going into us doesn't need to be painful at all yeah. because the truth is always joyous to accept once we understand the truth and, and accept it. it all, a, a, as an emotional experience, it's a very positive, joyful emotional experience. Mm. But because it confronts error, the error is the painful experience. Yes. And this is where people are shying away from experiencing their negative, uh, dark emotions but they, they must understand that the pain and suffering has been created by the choice to remain in error of either their own choice to remain in error or the choice of someone to create it within them. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've got to understand this relationship that the, the pain and suffering is not the result of truth mm -hmm. coming to them. It's the result of their cognizance of their error, yeah. which is a very different process. Yeah. 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 And the reality is that truth when it comes to us can always be joyous. Once we hit once we hit the point where we become at one with God, there's still lots of truth we need to accept. And every time we find out a new truth, it's just fantastic. <laughs> we never have a negative emotion about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I can think of a few examples maybe that I could bring up with you, but do you, do you feel it's better if we get on with the examples message? of what? Huh? Yeah. Um, just this idea of um, when it comes to recognising a law and beginning to act in harmony with it and the different reactions that can happen and how we might rebel against it and, and feel pain. Yeah, about I don't it. think we need to get no. bogged down in that yeah. in this discussion. Uh, Absolutely. I feel, Let's continue. I feel what a lot of people do by focusing on those particular things yeah. is they don't want to honour the truth of what, what's being stated here. Yeah. And, and we, we've got to be careful sometimes when we analyse events and... I feel a lot of times people analyse events and they say, well, you're saying this as a truth, but, but my experience is this. And I go, well, yes, your experience is that because you're in error. That's, <laughs> that's why you're experiencing that. And, and they say, no, but well, I can't accept that truth. And I say, fair enough. Um, you don't have to accept this truth, but you'll find to your own detrimental consequence <laughs> in the future that you would have probably been better if you did accept this truth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I feel a lot of times we can reason and analyse everyone's emotional experience, and, but, but actually they will automatically have emotional experiences if they honoured this truth. And I, yeah, you know. that's really what I'm saying. Is yeah. My experience is if I honour the law and act in faith and harmony with the law, there is pain, but ultimately there's a huge amount of liberation. But of yeah. course there's pain. Yeah. There's going to be pain because the soul's in error. Yes. But it's, it, there's not pain because the soul's in truth. Yeah. The pain is a direct result of the error. As I state in this message, it's the error and the desire and using of the will to act in harmony with it that creates the pain and suffering. Yeah. And that is the consequence. That's the negative consequence of the law. Yes. The positive consequence of the law, I feel, is what we need to be more focused on. The fact is that if we operate in harmony with love and truth and we do it, you exercise our will to do that, 
then we'll have all the positive consequences of the law. Yes. And I feel that many people who are still going through a lot of pain only want to focus on the negative consequences of the law without thinking at all about the positive consequences of the law. Absolutely. And, and I, uh, I just feel like if we, if we had faith in the positive consequences of the law, we wouldn't be so rebellious. And as you know, you like even with the rebellious feelings you have about fear, yeah. like that causes a lot of pain. Definitely. It would be far better to know and have faith in my no, actually, if I no longer live in harmony with my fear, I'll actually have more pleasure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, and I feel in this way we would have a lot more positive viewpoint of what of the divine truth. A lot of people have got a very negative viewpoint of it mm -hmm. because they're there sitting away processing through their error and not a lot of times they're not even doing that because they're in rebellion of facing the law. Yeah. So, so they want the law to be different, which, which is not processing emotionally. That's processing what I would call having a tantrum. <laughs> and most people are doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they wonder a year later why well, nothing's changed in their life. And it's because you've been processing a tantrum for a year. Exactly. <laughs> against the law. <laughs> and if we understand the law, that if we, you know, part of God's laws tell us that if we are releasing our error, there will be a positive consequence. We will grow. So if we've been telling ourselves we're releasing error. And then we still haven't grown. we haven't grown, our life hasn't changed. Then, then we haven't released error. <laughs> there's God's feedback saying, no, that wasn't exactly. real. Yeah. Exactly, that wasn't real. That wasn't a real experience. It was an imagined experience or a created experience or an experience based around tantruming and anger and rebellion. It was yeah. one of those experiences. Yeah. None of those experiences will ever result in a positive consequence yeah. because they all break the law. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another law, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So um, let's continue then. It yeah. says, let a man who has violated this harmony and thereby as to himself becomes disharmonious, again get into that harmony. And as to him, there would be no sin or error. And let every man do this and there would be no sin or error in all God's universe. <laughs> and that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And this is where I feel, you know, if we have these negative consequences that are coming out in our lives, we must understand we have violated the harmony of God's universe somehow yeah. inside of ourselves. There's been something that we've done, taken action of, and also feel, obviously our feelings drive our actions, mm -hmm. that that inside of ourselves is disharmonious with God's laws. Yeah. And what we need to do is have a desire to find out what it is, you know, and obviously prayer will help us a lot there. <laughs> talking to our spirit guides might help us a lot there yeah. or, or talking to other people who might know what it might be is going to also be beneficial. But if we shut that all down and we go, oh, I'm just experiencing something bad because, uh, you know, somebody did that. You know, or that person did this. And, yeah. and, and, and no, if they did something, they would be experiencing <laughs> the, the something bad as well. Yeah. You know? yeah. and, and while on earth we do have uh, these situations where a person isn't auto automatically con cognizant, if we do see our fear, uh, so we, we do see our pain and suffering, we must come to the conclusion that we ourselves have something in us that is out of harmony with the laws of God. And uh, I've discovered a lot of those things inside of me which were relating to my own treatment of myself. Mm -hmm. In other words, I was willing to treat myself badly and worse than I was willing to treat other people. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge disharmony with a lot of laws of God because all of God's laws of love are all about equality. In other words, I should be treating the other person and myself exactly the same, yeah. not differently. And every time I chose to treat another person differently than what God's laws demanded, I bore the consequences, even though I thought I was doing a loving thing. Yeah. And, and, and so then I realized that my pain and suffering was the result of this, me breaking the law, not somebody else breaking the law. And then you start adjusting your behavior. And then as you start adjusting your behavior, you deal with the emotions that caused it. And then once you release that, you no longer break the law with the subsequent result of the happiness that comes yes. from the positive the consequences, positive consequences yeah. of not yeah. breaking the law. Yeah. 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 So I repeat, there is no sin or error in the abstract in all the universe. And they appear only when man in the exercise of his will interferes 
as to himself in the harmony of God's laws. It makes no difference what the cause of this interference may be or in what way the will of man may have been exercised or for what reason to bring about this inharmony. The effect is the same. Because harmony and inharmony cannot exist together, no matter what the cause may be, no matter that in one case the cause may appear excusable or even apparently forced on the individual. Mm. The excuse for or apparent justification of the cause will not make what is inharmonious unite and work in unison with God's laws of harmony. And hence, the man whose will may be excused in the way mentioned by reason of hereditary or environments or want of proper mental or moral instruction is just as much out of harmony with the violated law as is the man who willfully violates the law. The penalty must be enforced just the same in each case as the only remedy is the restoration of the harmony. But there is this difference between the individuals of what may be called the involuntary class mm -hmm. and the individuals of the voluntary class. The former will find it easier mm -hmm. and with more rapidity to get into this condition of harmony than will the latter. So here we're talking about, uh, I was talking with him about this concept of sin and error, sin being any time we act out of harmony with love, every time we act out of harmony with one of God's laws. Mm -hmm. And remembering, of course, that all of God's laws are in complete harmony with love. Yep. So every time we choose to act out of harmony with one of God's laws, we are choosing to act out of harmony with love, and we are also choosing to sin. We're mm -hmm. choosing error, and the result of error sin and error is pain and suffering. Yes. So we're choosing pain and suffering. Yeah. And what I was saying here is that whether we did it for whatever reason, it didn't matter if I was influenced into doing it, pressured into doing it, forced to do it, whatever, there is still the disharmony. Yeah. And therefore the correction will occur. However, obviously if I voluntarily went ahead and did it, in other words, I did it because I wanted to. Or, and, and I knew it was And I wrong. knew it was wrong. Yeah. Or if I mistakenly went ahead and did it because I was forced into doing it or I didn't know I was right, there would be different, there would be different outcome because what the, de the outcome would be, be determined by is the fact that if I realise, oh, I did the wrong thing, then I'll probably be repentant a lot more, a lot faster yeah. than if I realised, no, I wanted to do the wrong thing. Yes. There's a big difference between those two states. And something that I've said to you recently, and I can't remember now if it was in another discussion that we've had on camera or just in private, but this idea that um, sometimes when people, are po the law is pointed out to them, at, or the error that they've made is pointed out to them, and they wish to justify and say, but I didn't know. And, you know, this to me indicates that they are already justifying the error within them. Exactly. So there is, they are almost voluntarily doing, you know, they're endorsing their own error. Exactly. Whereas if we had a feeling inside of us of, I want to love, then and we, and we had a feeling almost of shock of, oh, wow, I've been unloving there and I can see it now. Well, that's the thing. If we want to love, then if someone tells us when we've been unloving, mm -hmm. we go, thank you. <laughs> I've got to remedy that. You yeah. know, this is important. Yeah. But I see a lot of people who resist the... And justify their previous actions. Yeah, and yeah. they want to make an excuse and all of these yeah. things. And, and tell all us all of... the reasons why they did that particular thing. And almost that, that I was innocent, I didn't know. And yet if you want to take that stance, that's, that's actually highlighting to you that you want to justify the error. So you can't call yourself innocent anymore. No, no. and you can't call yourself a, a person who was of the involuntary class. Yes. Because now you're actually justifying your own action in the past, which means that the action was probably voluntary. In other words, it was probably engaged because you wanted to. And, there, and there's, uh, you know, all of us have inside of us a conscience that God has given us mm. that is sensitive to disharmony with love. Yeah. And that's something we spoke about in book group on a couple of occasions, you know, because a lot of people will want to say, oh, I didn't know, and therefore I shouldn't have to have any consequences. And yet... And here I'm basically saying, look, whether you didn't know or not, the consequence is identical with one exception, and that is because you didn't know, if you sincerely didn't know, and you sincerely you know, desire, to, desire to change, then you'll probably be repentant much quick, more quickly and yes. therefore change much, more, more, you know, much faster than if you did know yeah. and you desired to still go ahead with the action. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
But, but either way, the consequence has to be the same, if you think about it, because, yeah. because if the consequence was not the same, then, of course, uh, you'd have different rules for different people. Yeah. And that, that wouldn't work at all. And we couldn't understand the true nature of love. Mm. If there was a different consequence, if, if you and I took the same action... And for whatever reason. For whatever reason. And we saw different results. How could we understand the law of cause and effect? Exactly. So the, the reality is on our soul, the consequence is identical for the same action. The difference is the attitude of our soul towards the action. Yeah. If the attitude of our soul towards the action was one of, yeah, I want to do that, then of course the, con the, the consequence would be the same, but the chances of me changing are very remote. If, the, if, if it's pointed out to me and my reaction is, wow, I didn't realise that, now yeah. I realise that, yeah. that really you know, hits me, yeah. now there's a good indication that, that my soul is in a better condition and will change. And, and, and will naturally and actually will naturally start to interact with other laws, like the law yeah. of repentance, exactly. rather than when I want to justify, I'm engaging the law of compensation here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's very important for people, I feel, to understand that every single law has the identical, if you follow it, it has an identical consequence positively. Mm -hmm. And no matter who follows it, it will be an identical consequence positively. Yeah. And whoever breaks the law in the, in the manner in which they've broken it will have an identical consequence negatively yeah. if they decide to go and, and break it or even if they mistakenly break it or whatever, for whatever reason they break it, they were forced to break it or whatever, it will still have the identical consequence. And perhaps if we can illustrate this uh, through the law of gravity, and yeah. this will give us a good illustration perhaps that I've used many times before. There's three possibilities with the law of gravity. If we're standing on, a, let's say, a cliff, uh, and it's a very, very high cliff, there's three possibilities. We decide we jump, we're going to jump off. Yeah. That's, that's one. The, the consequence is our physical body will probably die. Mm -hmm. If we're pushed off, the consequence is our physical body dies. If we're walking along the edge and we mistakenly fall off, the consequence probably will be the same. Yeah. Our physical body will die unless there's some other factor like we've got wings or some other thing <laughs> that prevents us, we will hit the ground and if, we, if it's a high enough cliff, the impact of that will cause our physical body to pass. So the consequence of breaking the law of gravity in each case is identical. Yeah. The, where it's different is if I mistakenly fell off, I'd pass into the spirit world and feel like, oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> that was yeah. a terrible Oops. mistake. <laughs> Whoops. <Yeah. laughs> if I was pushed off, I might have some anger and rage towards the persons who pushed me off to experience, and I might have to forgive them and then go through the forgiveness of that, and then, uh, you know, I'll be in a better condition. But if I chose to jump off, yeah. now that was, a, that was a complete free will choice exercise through my own desire. And now, obviously there are, is going to be much stronger effects on my soul yeah. uh, for the choice that yeah. I made. So the physical consequence of breaking the physical law is identical in each case, mm -hmm. but because of my attitude towards it or the situation in which it occurred, the results may be different once I hit the spirit world. Yeah. And this is an illustration of how the law is the same whenever you break, whenever you get into disharmony with the law, it's the same, the same consequence, but the soul condition of the individual will determine the, the rapidity of, uh, of which they get out of the, consequence, the consequential situation. Yeah, yeah. And, and we could even bring that to a more of a soul-based law, couldn't we? If mm -hmm. there's a, a little kid who's, you know, engaged in soccer and he loves soccer, it's totally... A, his dream and his parents take him to soccer every week and he's got his grand final coming up and the parents know how important it is and they say yeah yeah we'll take you and we'll be there an hour beforehand so you can be ready in it. and it's a big thing in his life mm -hmm. and then something happens the father um, gets engrossed in his work he completely forgets to take the kid to the soccer match now the result for that kid is like extreme disappointment feeling he's let his team down all, all of these things and uh, so that's one scenario. The other scenario is that the, the dad um, gets in a car accident and he can't come home and, you, you know, take the kid to the soccer mat. Mm -hmm. And the third example is, I, I don't know, what's the third example? You know, he goes out drinking. Or he purposefully. <laughs> he purposely he just <laughs> he says, you know that. what, <laughs> you, you're selfish. I'm not taking you and, and sits at home and watch footy. Yeah. Now, for the child, the, the emotional consequence is the same in, well, 
it's hard when you talk about the soul, isn't it? That's why you talk about the law of gravity, because there's a lot of inter there's a lot of well, there is a, yeah. The problem with bringing up such an example that you've brought up is that there are far more things happening in terms of what's happening now, yeah. in terms of the laws that the father has broken. Yes. So, so, so now the consequences will be very different. I was trying to relate to the consequences for the child. It'll still be different for the child yeah. because and that, and of the different where I got laws in that yeah. have been broken. Because, yeah. because in this example that you've raised, there is a difference between a purposeful action on the part of the father compared to a mistake on the part of the father, yeah. compared to a, uh, um, uh, what was the third option? One was a... One was, <laughs> I think we need to scrap the example. <laughs> but, but if we can see, there, there is a difference in the attitude of the father yeah. in each case. Yeah. And the difference in the attitude of the father is actually going to cause a different consequence. So what if we take the idea of corporal punishment in child rearing? One where a person feels that this is the right thing to do, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's my duty as a parent to hit my... I think you're going down the same track. Okay. Because, you're, because the attitude, again, of the parents is going to cause different consequences for the child. So, for example, if yeah. the attitude of the parent is one of violence and they definitely want to take out their violence on their child in an abusive way, that, that will have a different consequence on the child to, to the parent feeling like they are smacking the child because God tells them to, mm -hmm. that, that will have a different consequence on the child compared to the parent just slapping them as an instant re reaction to something that happened, that yeah. will have a different consequence on the child compared yeah. to the parent choosing to discipline the child in a non-violent manner. This is why so. I'm so happy that God controls the laws and we Well, don't well the, the <laughs> issue is that God has established the laws and fixed them and doesn't control them. The laws control themselves. I understand. But but, yeah, so, so what, what I love about that system is, is you could think of the laws as a framework in which the universe cre is created. And in fact, um, because of that, the laws had to exist before the universe was created. And that's a very clever God, if you think about totally. it. A very clever creative being created all of the structure of the law in which the universe can function before the universe itself came into being. Yeah. And, uh, and if we think about it like that, we will come to understand and also come to love every single law that God has ever created yeah. and, and understand that there is love, that love is the purpose of each law's creation. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel this is one of the things we need to get gleaned from this particular um, message. message. What I was trying to share with Paget was, firstly, this, in, this truth and error discussion, the, 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 co the consequences of error versus the consequences of living in harmony with truth, and what happens in terms of error fighting for itself, trying to justify its position, trying to make sure that it did what it wanted everyone to do, and forcing itself upon people. Whereas truth stays solid in a non-compromising position, it does not force itself upon other people. It just stays in itself in a non-compromising, uncompromising position. It shares itself with the world without forcing itself upon the world. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to help him understand truth and error. Then we wanted to help him understand living in harmony with law in versus disharmony with law, So, which is, which is the difference between living in harmony with truth and sinning. Mm -hmm. And now I wanted to help him understand the, the difference between those two states is every single time we choose or mistakenly act out of harmony with the law, the consequences will reflect to us that we have acted out of harmony with the law. And the consequences are personal. If it's happening to me, it's not because you chose to act out of harmony with the law or just because you chose. Yeah. to act out of harmony with law. It's also because there's something inside of me that, yeah. that causes the response, the, the pain and suffering response for the action. Yeah. And that is an indication that something exists inside of me that is out, out of harmony with the law, not yeah. you. Yeah. Even though you might have been out of harmony with law as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to illustrate both factors to him, the importance of him understanding these, these principles about law, sin and truth and error.
and seeing how they all relate to each other. Yeah, and you say, like there's some very, very powerful points all the way through. You point out that error will fight for itself, truth will stand. Firm a, without fighting. Alone. Yeah. You point out that you didn't come in order to create division, but rather create harmony in truth. Yes, and truth is the thing that creates harmony. And truth is the thing that creates <laughs> harmony. Yeah. Um, you talk about the fact that truth never compels people against their will. Yes. Um, you say that truth is of itself a thing apart and admits no variance or modifications. So here is, I'm speaking of divine truth. Yes. It never can be modified. It never will be modified. God's set it in stone <laughs> and, and the truth is always the truth no matter what we believe. No matter what we believe, it exists alone. It exists and alone. And it could be that no single person on the planet believes it and yet it's still the truth. <laughs> yes. Yep. And that has implications if we are in harmony with divine truth, we won't alter from the knowledge of that either. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be immovable once we've once the divine truth has entered our heart, we will be immovable on it. Uh, I feel that's different to the position of stubbornness. Right? Yeah. Because a, a person who's stubborn will often hold on to their error in, in an immovable manner. But sooner or later in God's universe the error will go and they'll have to accept the truth. Yeah. God's created this universe where it doesn't matter how long that takes, it might take a thousand years. <laughs> But if it takes a thousand years, it takes a thousand years. And and if it, to be honest, if it takes a thousand years, it just demonstrates how stubborn you were. <laughs> not yeah. not anything else. It demonstrates how rebellious you were yes. towards law. Because there's a lot of factors operating upon us to bring us in harmony. Exactly. Yeah. And if it if it takes one year, then it means that you were very humble towards law. You were very you know you desired law intensely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you also say that. Error does not exist in the world because God created it or permits it. Is that very this important. Is important. Yeah. This is a basic thing about God's nature and character. I feel God keeps getting attributed things that uh, nothing to do with God. So, so a lot of people on this planet still see their pain and suffering as God's fault and they still see error on the planet as God's fault. And, and the only way that it could in any way be attributed to God is God gave us free will. Yeah. But how can it even then be attributed? Free will is a gift. It's, it's and a it's ours, gift. it's not God's. And it's ours. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, when somebody gives you a gift, it's like me giving you a camera and you deciding to smash it against a rock. <laughs> like, yeah. like, can I be blamed for giving you the camera? <laughs> of course not. Like, you're, you, you, you would be to blame for smashing against the rock, yeah. you know? That's yeah. why it's not working anymore. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is something that we must understand. And, and so many people are rebellious to even understanding that, that we, that we know of who come along regularly to our sessions. Yes. They, they still want to hold on to this concept that if something bad's going on in their life, then someone else other than their own creation is to blame for it. Yeah. And this is a very false concept. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, you said, as he wills, so he shall be, which is very important, isn't it? Yeah. As we use our will, so we will be. And yes. Uh, the we'll use become. of our will is the primary reason why God, uh, when we went through the incarnation process. So we can learn, one of the things was to learn how to use our will. Yeah. And we, because we've given this free expression of our will, we can choose to use it negatively out of harmony with God's laws or in harmony with God's laws. It's up to us mm -hmm. which way we use it. And it's very important that we understand that it's the use of our will that determines our happiness, not the use of somebody else's will <laughs> or the manipulation of somebody else's will yeah. or, or their manipulation or... of our will, yeah. Yeah. but rather the use of our own will, taking full responsibility for the use of our own will is what creates happiness if we exercise this will in harmony with truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That consequences are sure, that there will be consequences. And so they can positive be or positive negative. or negative. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's really crucial as well because yeah. often we associate it all with negativity. Exactly. We? Oftentimes yeah. because we're quite negative, we have a tendency <laughs> to see everything quite negatively. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you said also that the consequences are the same for for acting in disharmony with the law or acting in harmony with the law. Mm. They, they can be positive or negative, but they're the same for all of us. Yes, and the only reason why the subsequent results may be different is because of what happens in our soul from that moment on. So if, I, if I'm really rebellious in the law 
and I act out of harmony with the law, and I still purposely act out of harmony with the law, and I'm still rebellious about the fact that yeah. I've done it, then obviously the consequences are going to be far more extreme yeah. for us in, our, in the, our future existence than if I act out of harmony with the law, but it was a big mistake, and, yeah. I, and I realise it's a big mistake. Yeah, and if we try to save my very poor example that I tried to give <laughs> yeah. of the dad and the soccer match, yeah, yeah. the dad in that situation, the consequence on his soul is the same, but his response to it is going to be different, isn't it? Depending on De what his Depending on what his motivations is. and his yeah. conditions and so how much So if he just he wanted to, to punish see. the child, then obviously, you know, it's yeah. going to, he, he, he chose a purposeful action. The consequence on Dad's soul is going to be greater. Yeah. Than, and also, obviously, there's going to be feedback from that from the son. Uh, whereas if, uh, if the consequences were a weakness, that's going to be shown to him, but if it was a mistake, that would be shown to him as well. Like, yeah. the consequence will be different in each case. But he will feel the consequence. Mm -hmm. He will feel the fact that he did of his unloving action mm -hmm. and how, based on how he responds. And if he's affects. sensitive to the feeling, yeah. he will change his actions readily. Yeah. Yes. If he's not sensitive to feeling or he purposefully undertook the feeling, he probably won't change his actions. And that's going to and mean that's going he's to have engaging. bigger the, consequences. Yes, yeah. 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 Future Different consequences. Horse. Yes, yeah. 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 Yep. Sure. Okay. Yep. So that was just a summary of all, like the really pertinent points that you yeah. covered there. So shall I read the last paragraph yes. and then we can just sort of finalise the yeah, discussion. Sure. So men must not accuse God in permitting sin and error to exist in the world. And notice I say men must not <laughs> yeah. accuse God. And the reason why I said must was because I feel this whole accusation towards God disconnects them completely from any desire for a relationship with God. Yeah. And so it's, it's imperative that we stop accusing God for things mm -hmm. that God has never done. So men must not accuse God in permitting sin and error to exist in the world as they do not exist except as man brings them into existence by the wrongful exercise of his will. All sin and error being bring their sufferings. And if there were no sufferings and men were permitted to exercise their wills irrespective of the laws which govern the universe without incurring the penalties, then the only result would be that anarchy would prevail in all God's universe where men live and in the spirit universe as well. For the will and its great franchise of unrestricted exercise pass with the mortal when he leaves his material body. So with all my love, I will say good night, your brother and friend, Jesus. So in conclusion, I was basically saying, imagine if God had created a different world, a yes, different universe. Yeah. Imagine that if God created the universe that most men want, yeah. which is this universe that I can do whatever I want without a consequence. Now, if God had actually created such a universe, there would be anarchy in the universe. There would be complete anarchy in every corner of the universe mm -hmm. as a result of that of that creation. Now, God gave us this gift of free will, but God's also got his own will. And his will is that he wants nice, peaceful harmony to exist in his universe. And, and as, <laughs> as a loving parent, he wants his children to understand love, doesn't of course, he? And of to, course. to understand the joys and of living in harmony with love. Of course. So he's put in place this system which kind of draws us to that point, doesn't it? Of course, it? yeah. So what we're trying to do is we, we need to see that God created this beautiful universe of harmony, this beautiful universe that can only result in, in the end, no matter how long it takes, <laughs> in the end it can only result in mankind being happy. Yeah. Because sooner or later, every single man and woman on this planet and in the spirit world will realise that there is some law that they've been out of harmony with. <laughs> That's what's created their pain. Mm. And once they realise that, they'll start looking at themselves and trying to adjust this issue, issue even if it takes 100,000 years for them to do that. Eventually, they will do that. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, the longer it takes, it means the harder they were, you know, the more stubborn they were. Um, but it, but it, it, I feel personally that it's impossible that it will take forever because, because if you look at it, there is only a certain amount of sin and degradation that can actually be engaged by one person in a lifetime on earth. Yeah. And so as a result of that, there is only a certain amount of pain and suffering that they can ever experience in the spirit world. And as a result of that, there's a certain amount of correction that they will experience. And as a result of that, they will eventually arrive in a place of happiness 
in the end. Yeah. And God's created this beautiful universe where only happiness can be the end result. But the unrestricted use of our will, which is something that most people on earth still desire to engage, is never going to be of any good for any of us. Mm -hmm. And it won't be any good for the person who's using their will in an unrestricted manner. But also it will never be good for a person who's surrounding, you know, people who are living with those people who are using their will in an unrestricted manner. It's interesting, isn't it, though, because if we develop in love, we don't feel restriction on our will anyway. No. We desire to use it in an unrestricted way, but it's all in harmony with love, isn't it? Well, and there's a reason why we don't feel restricted, because the reality is we're not. Exactly. So, see, see, every time we act out of harmony with law, the law places a restriction. It, it, a restriction is enforced yes. on us. And with, along with this restriction is pain and suffering. So, so if we understand that there is a correlation between restriction and pain and suffering, pain and suffering and restrictions go hand in hand with each other. When we act in harmony with the law, because we're acting in harmony with the law, there is no restriction. There is no negative consequence that actually pulls us back into line, mm -hmm. that, that corrects us. And as a result of that, there is no restriction. And if there's no restriction, then of course we feel free yeah. because we are free. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is how we become free. We yeah. become free by engaging the law in, a, in, in harmony with love. And as a result, it's like there is no law in the end. Yeah. We can do anything we want because yes. everything we want is in harmony with love. And so everything we want, we can do, we unrestricted. And, and, and this is what the if we think about it, is also to do with the hells of the spirit world. Yes. The hells are about the severity of restriction yes. that needs to be placed upon rebellious souls. Mm -hmm. And that's what the hells are all about, the, the restrictions that are placed as a consequence of them breaking the law. Yeah, and, and I see that and, and I feel very excited at the thought of, of some of us bringing our wills into harmony with love here on earth mm. because we see what happens in the spirit world that every time a person decides to use their will to come more into harmony with love like the potentials are so great that and they do it voluntarily and they do it voluntarily through they desire it mm -hmm. A whole new sphere can be created. Yeah, a that's whole new the, dimensional existence. That's how new creative. Universes. That's how creative our potential is when it's in harmony with love. Exactly. So we see, you know, you've created all of these different spheres, and even then, as as me or someone else or any other person uses their will and enters those and spheres. enters those spheres. It, whole new things in that sphere appear. It totally changes that sphere. <laughs> yeah. That's the uniqueness and the creative potential of us. Yeah. That it's demonstrated in, like, th this operation of all the laws is so clearly demonstrated in the spirit world. Yes. What's it going to be like when more than one of us, when a group of us decides to use our will in harmony with love. And in harmony with law. In harmony <laughs> with law on earth. Yeah. What are the potentials that God's going to show us? Exactly. Because it hasn't been done before. No. And I so, uh, it's such a dream for yeah, me that yeah. we see that. Yeah. yeah. And so, th th and that's really what I was saying to Paget too, is that the, the, we have so much potential mm. to actually live in a completely different universe. And, it, and in particular on Earth, a completely different planet. If we begin to voluntarily engage God's laws yeah. instead of doing what we as humanity are currently doing, which is positively exercising <laughs> our voluntary will to not engage God's laws. And fighting for and error. And fighting forever. Defending our error. Yeah. yeah. And, and, we, and, and this is a problem for any person who eventually discovers divine truth, because any person who discovers divine truth is going to find there is a confrontation within themselves of how much they still want to hold on to the error yeah. of how much they still would dearly love to, you know, do or do the old things they used to do yeah. and be the old person they used to be because, you know, it gave them all their addictions or met, met, it met a lot of the things that they des thought they desired. Yeah. And, and that is a, a, one of the biggest shifts that a person needs to make, this shift away from trying, trying, trying to continually do what they will where, irrespective of, of whether it's in harmony with love or, or in law, law. Yeah. or now conforming to what 
God's laws have, which are all based around love, have determined, and then feeling the results of that conformity. Mm -hmm. The majority of people on this planet hate conformity mm -hmm. to law. They, they are so sick of mankind's law, many of which are unfair, of course, and so they engage this rebellion towards law. But, but also the very first human couple engaged rebellion towards God's laws. And so this is a common injury that's throughout the planet and throughout almost every person that's ever lived here is, is this common injury of wanting to rebel against God's laws. Yeah. And, and this desire to rebel against God's laws causes the will to be exercised in such a direction that pain and suffering is the only result. And if, if we can change that within ourselves, change this rebellious attitude that we have and desire to live in harmony with loving laws, yeah. then we would have a different result. And I feel that the message itself hopefully imparts that across to any person who reads it. Yeah, and thank you for, you chose this message to revisit and it's lovely to have you talk about <laughs> the message that you gave. Yeah. I feel that God, God and God's laws are still largely, even amongst people that we know, there are, there, there are a lot of blocks up to that, to embracing yeah. even God and even making God a really important part of, of our lives. Well, one of the reasons and why that is too is because God's laws were created by God to lead us to God. Yeah. So, so every time we purposefully break a law of God, we are actually walking away from God purposefully. Yeah. And that obviously is never going to result in us ever becoming at one with God. Or even just getting a little bit closer and feeling... Exactly. ...receiving the... And receiving more love from God. Yes, and yeah. understanding that God's loving. And as we do that, then we begin to see the love in his laws as well. Yes. And, um, yeah, so I feel it's a... a it's a lovely and confronting message. I feel if, if someone wants to really delve into the what's in, inside of this message that you've touched on. I yes. just feel there's a lot there. Yeah. And there are a lot of pageant messages that are very similar to this in the sense that if you fully understand what they're talking about, it will change your life just by understanding and one reading message, it. Just yeah. one message. Yeah. And I, I feel that for the majority of people who read such a message, it doesn't change their life because they don't understand fully what, what it means. Yeah. And uh, this is why having a discussion about some of these messages I feel is very important because we need to understand what some of these messages mean. And if we did understand them, our entire life would change in a day. Our choices would change. Our, what we choose to do in our future would change. Everything would change if we, if we truly, at the soul level, understood the message, this kind of a message. And there, there are a lot of these kind of messages in the pageant messages. So, and, and so I, I'd again like to encourage anybody who, who's listening to these discussions to read the pageant messages and to, and to ponder over the, what's actually being said in each of the messages because they will have a powerful effect on your life if you choose to act upon them, yeah. only if you choose to act upon them and only if you understand them properly and choose to act upon them, will they have this powerful and motivational effect in your life? So we'd like to thank you for joining us in this particular discussion of my message on December the 25th in 1915. And I'd like to thank yeah. Mary for her time in the discussion and Lena and Igor for recording this uh, the second time round <laughs> uh, from, from yesterday. Um, and we'll continue doing some more messages that we've selected over the next few weeks. Thanks for your time. <laughs>